every day. I find a new reason to thank God for one of the wonders of creation. For a thing that guides and protects me. A light to the nations which shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. I am of course talking about the GPS app on my phone. Moving to a new place where the lighting at night is minimal and street signs are not always as abundant or obvious as I might wish. Until I learn the geography of this area on my own, I need that GPS. Without Google Maps, I would probably still be driving around somewhere between Seymour and Naugatuck, hopelessly lost in the wilds of Route 8. Street signs are wondrous things, but they really only get you so far. You need to know where you're going and which direction to turn. It would be helpful if the otherwise benign green signs would light up as I approach and say things like, Tuesday, turn left here. It would be helpful if they would say some other things as well, like, remember to pick up cat food on your way home, or have you called your mother this week? Alas, the job of signs is not to give direction. The job of signs is to tell us where we are to provide evidence of what's happening, the outward and visible indicator of something inward and unseen. This morning, we have two stories of signs, the story of the burning bush in Exodus and the parable of a fig tree that does not produce fruit, at least not yet. Both stories give us dramatic visual examples evidence of what is happening beyond what we can see. The first is the fire of the burning bush from Exodus. We encounter Moses, a simple farmer herding his father-in-law's flocks in some place called Beyond the Wilderness, which I think is up to the northern part of the state just before you hit Massachusetts. A bit of backstory on Moses. He's Hebrew by birth, born at a time when his people lived as slaves in the foreign land of Egypt. When Pharaoh pronounces a genocide of infant boys to curb the growing population of slaves, Moses' mother puts her baby in a basket of reeds with a blanket and a prayer and floats him down the Nile River. When none other than Pharaoh's own daughter sees the reed basket and the little fellow inside, Moses is rescued adopted and raised in a life of security and luxury as a member of the privileged class of Egyptians. Fast forward to his early adulthood when he learns by seeing how the Hebrew people, his own people, are treated by their Egyptian captors. In his anger, Moses murders an Egyptian for beating on one of his own people, an act of violence he soon comes to regret an act of violence that, as usual, solves exactly nothing except to make Moses an outlaw. Moses runs, he runs far away, away from his adoptive family, away from the slavery he sees, away from the city and finds himself making a new life with a new family. No longer the adopted son of royalty knows Moses is now working for his father-in-law, wandering beyond the wilderness with goats and sheep for company. Is there any place we can go to get away from God? Well, Moses, I think the text goes to show you can run, but you cannot hide when it comes to God's eye. It must have been a shock to see the bush on Mount Horeb, a bush that was burned but not consumed, which reminds me, I hope you all saw Ed Hord's cartoon in the eConnections this week. If not, it's a good reason to go check it out. <laughs> Clearly, this burning bush is a sign of some kind, one that indicates the presence of something special, powerful, even supernatural. Naturally, Moses wants to investigate, and he hears the voice of God say, Whoa there, fella. You take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Who knew that just by showing up to work today, in the rocks and the scrub, 
that Moses would find himself in a place as holy as any temple. A place where he would have to take off his shoes so his feet could connect with the sacred earth. This bush is the sign, the indicator of where Moses is, which is to say someplace very special. And that there's evidence of something big at work, a message from God. But in order to know what to do next, Moses has to listen to what God is saying. So God tells him where he himself has been. He says, I'm the God of your ancestors, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God who remembers his promise. I'm the God who has seen my people, and I'm the God who has a plan to free the people from slavery. And if I am Moses at this point, I may be thinking, great, cool, 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 cool. That sounds good, whoever you are. Good luck with that. You know how it all turns out. And so Moses is probably not a little surprised to hear God say next, so come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whoa. Wait, what? And here Moses feels the need to question God, as I would, and probably many of us would, when we feel like God is giving a task that we are not at all ready for. He says, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Who am I? Because uh, God, or to whom it may concern, I am one of those 90% of people who fear public speaking more than death. And I don't know if you remember this, but I'm a fugitive from murder, and the guy who's neither fully Hebrew nor fully Egyptian, so I think, God, you may have the wrong guy. I'm really sorry you wasted your time. Sorry about the burning bush. But God says to Moses, don't you worry about any of that. I'll be with you. And this shall be a sign for you. This bush, this sign, this moment is a marker, an indicator, a reminder of where Moses really is. Where he is, but Moses needs more. I would need more too. This is big stuff, and a mere sign is not enough to do it. A mere sign is not enough to get me to trust where God wants me to go next. Moses asks this voice, this God, who he is. And I wonder if in the question, Moses is not only looking for confirmation of who the Almighty is, but who he himself is. When he says, but who shall I tell them? Are you? And God says, I am who I am. I am who I am. And you are who you are. Are you Egyptian? Are you Hebrew? Are you a stutterer? Are you a farmer? You are who you are because I am who I am. God is not just making a pun on the tetragrammaton, the four letters that make up the word Yahweh, a name too holy to be spoken out loud, though I want it to be noted for the record that God likes puns. God is saying, I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. The verbs in English don't add up to the I was, I am, and I will be quality of this name. Past, present, and future, God is. And it's God's presence, God's is, God's has, is, and will be that makes the difference between a shy and ashamed stutterer to the leader of a nation. God's presence is where we call on when we are in a situation where we cannot see the outcome. When we say, God, I am not up to this. Please pick someone else. When they put that new baby in your arms for the very first time, or handed you the keys when you signed that mortgage, when the doctor gave you the diagnosis, or the school principal called and it was not good news, I am what I am means that it's okay. You are who you are, but I am who I am. I will be with you through all of this. 
none of us, none of us comes fully equipped with what we need to meet the challenges and opportunities of our lives. It's when we open up, I am who I am, and make room that we find the strength and the presence to get through what we've got to get through. It gets tricky though. God sends us a second sign, the sign that Jesus describes. He gives us a parable of these wonderful stories. They're like Zen koans. One of my favorite Zen koans is, what's the sound of one hand clapping? It's an unsolvable problem. Of course, I have solved it for you, it's this. <laughs> it's a very faint sound. But the, the parable is complicated, it's tricky. It involves another kind of sign. There's a bush, a fruit tree, a fig tree, and it should give you the most luscious, yummy, luxurious fig you've ever had. When I think of figs, I think of an August that I spent in Paris, where you would go every morning to the green grocer and they would hand you, in Paris, I don't know if you have been there, but when you go grocery shopping in Paris, you don't get to pick out the fruit that you want. You say, Je m'appelle, uh, no, je would like some uh, figs, see you play. I say that anyway. And, and the grocer looks at you, assesses you, looks into your very soul, and hands you the figs that they think are appropriate for you. <laughs> they were the best figs I've ever had in my life. So rich, so sweet, so perfect. That's what, that's what we we're trying to put out. It's wonderful, rich, sweet, perfect food. Well, most of the time, I don't feel like I'm capable of putting out even the most meager crab apple, let alone one of these Parisian figs. And I fear that God is out there, like the landowner, walking around, looking at my life, saying, poof, that thing's not putting out much fruit. It's got to go. You don't have a place in this garden. This isn't for you. There's no sign, there's no evidence in your life that you're doing anything with the gifts that I've given you, with the space that I've given you. I feel that anxiety that I'm not enough, that I can never do or be enough, that the signs of my life don't add up to everything I've been given. And here comes the gardener who says, mm, slow down. You know what it will take to make this fig tree bloom, to give you those luscious, yummy, Right fix? Take a whole pile of crap. <laughs> the promise of Jesus is that all the garbage, all the manure, all the crap from our lives is going to get turned over to him. When you turn it over and turn it over the way you turn over good manure, you turn it over and expose it to sunshine and air and light, and what happens? You get great looking roses, your azaleas have more color, and the figs come back. The promise is Jesus is, give me all the manure and let me worry about how to make the fruit. You keep showing up. We keep giving God all that we have. Everything, our best and our worst. God wants it all. This is what I think we mean when we say things like we empty ourselves. It's not that we want to suppress our personalities and become pod people for the Lord. What we're looking to do instead is say, everything that I have and everything that I am, I turn it over to you. And then God turns it and turns it back into something else. We don't have to come fully equipped with everything we need, which is good because we don't. That is not for us to do. Instead, what we do is to notice the signs, to notice where God is present, to notice, oh, that person over there is asking these questions. That's like a little version of a burning bush right there in my midst. And to take a moment to take off our shoes and notice when we're standing on holy ground. 
The holy ground of I don't know what to do. The holy ground of the pain of a friend. The holy ground of joy in someone else's success or our own. Our lives are holy ground. Our jobs can notice. And all the crap that comes our way to turn back to God and trust that it's going to come back as fruit. In the name of God.